Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have in your house some form of a security system? Something that would be there either for fire or for theft. And even today, it seems like people are adding a carbon monoxide security system in their home. Well, you know the answer to that is because we realize that there could be danger lurking out there. And these systems alert us to the danger that could be there. But did you also notice that out in the world today that there can be belief systems that can also harm us intellectually as well as spiritually? I'm sure you recognize that. Even today, information that is given to us, we seem to find that after further study and maybe even more research, that the information that we have believed and probably even applied became so wrong that it became detrimental to our health. How many times throughout the year have we read where that they have released earlier particular pharmacies and drugs that we might be able to take, medicine, only to find out that after further research that there was a flaw in it and the data wasn't accurate and unfortunately people have been taking it and it has been a detriment to their own health. Well, we can see that in the physical realm, but I think now we're starting to realize as believers in Christ that we live in a world too that a lot of information that is given to us, even on the spiritual and intellectual level, may not be accurate the problem is when it's given to us and should we engage our thinking into it it'll affect our mind and eventually for some people because we do tend to want to believe it affects our value system we then want to embrace it maybe even as truth sometimes with a lot of, of time not given into good accurate research and then finally it translates into a behavioral a change in our lifestyle and when it's all said and done after we perhaps die then we have to stand before God and we have to give an account to the Lord of how we lived our life and usually our life is lived based upon a value system that we've embraced because of certain teaching that we had well while we know that today in our life we also know that it also occurred so much in the Bible days that the Lord led the Apostle Paul to be able to write to a group of people at Colossae that lived in an environment very much like our own a lot of information that was given to them in fact there's also those that had a certain belief system that when they came to Christ as their Savior, while they did embrace faith alone in Christ, they still took into their new relationship in Christ a lot of misinformation from their other religious upbringing, thus confounding it all, especially when those people were permitted or even encouraged to teach the Word and they didn't have good, accurate knowledge. So to preserve the faith, then Paul was directed by the Holy Spirit to give some cautions. What I'd like to do is to select from our passage what we might call a contrast between what is known as the secular worldview and then contrast it against the biblical or the Christian worldview. Now those of you who are our guests here today, I'm so glad that you're with us. And I would like you to know that you're in an environment of people that really love the Lord and they really want to know God's truth. And I hope you'd come along on this journey of being able to understand the difference between the two. So if you will, let's look at the first one here. This is called the secular worldview in the area of false human teaching. Look at the beginning of the verse that it said, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world. And we'll stop there. You'll notice that the first part of it, it says beware. You know, when it says the word beware, it says take heed, watch out. There could be danger that could lurk ahead. Some of you that have been at some of our tourist spots on the island, especially when you would go over to the blowhole in those areas, it talked about you can go this far but no further. And it says beware, danger. How many of you have read in the newspaper people who have decided either for a picture or to even go fishing or PE picking, they've gone beyond the danger sign and some of them suffered tremendously because they've done that. And so what God is saying to us is you can go this far but no further. Beware. And then now he lays it out for us what we should be aware of. And he talks about here, beware that anyone would cheat us. Now the word cheat is an interesting word because actually it means to be taken ca captive or taken hostage almost. It's like someone that would come in as a pirate and grab a hold of the booty. Well, that means that there are people, there are belief systems that would like to grab a hold of our minds and hold it hostage against the truth or from the truth and be able to fill our minds with things that are not true. And then it talks about philosophy. 
And I'd like to pause on that just a little bit. Because sometimes those of you that have been Christians a long time, when you hear the term philosophy, you could think that all philosophy is bad. And it's not necessarily the case. Some of these preachers even refer to philosophy as philosophy. Well, I want us to be very careful that we don't throw all philosophy and the whole concept of philosophy into something that would not be always uh, uh, good. There are times that it can be good. So let me explain to you some of the philosophies and what it means. I'm not here trying to teach a class in philosophy, but I want to prepare our young people that they will be taking some forms of philosophy and they've already been subject to philosophizing being done on them by what they might hear even on the radio or television and even in their own classes today. Well, first of all, let's talk about philosophy. In this context, it talks about philosophy of the world that's based upon a world system. Well, generally, that's an old philosophy, meaning that there's not a lot of new philosophical things that are coming out. It's really being built off of something that's been around a long time. It might have a spin here or there, but it's all basically under the same. That's why when you study philosophy, most of the philosophy you'll study in school is taken from older philosophy. Now, some guys will twist it, but you can always find it going back to a basic philosophy. Secondly, it's what we might call rudimentary or elementary. Now, I want you to know philosophy does not have to be difficult to understand if you apply your mind to it and really understand where this whole thing of philosophy is going. But also you need to know that philosophy is often, the days, today's philosophy is built on what we will call a world view, a world system rather than a biblical system. And when you have a world system view, the world system, similar to Christian, begins to ask questions. And I'm sure some of you had enough uh, training or maybe teaching in this. They ask such questions such as, how did we get here? How has the origin of the world begun? Now, scientists will try to do it from a scientific point of view. Philosophers will try to do it through a rational point of view. At least they think so. Who is man? How did man get here? Why is man here? Where is man going? What is the purpose of life? Where did evil come from? Why is there evil? Why can't we conquer evil? Is there a God? Can you know God if there is a God? How do you know which is the right God? And so there's a lot of that philosophy that's out there. The problem often, though, with the world philosophy is that when you look at that philosophy, they try to reduce it down to whatever understanding that they can, but they often, and they usually do, leave God as the premise or the foundation out of it or the biblicalness of God out of it. So they'll reduce it all down. They can't really come to a conclusion, so different ones will debate different philosophies. Now, if we can fast forward it into the time of Greece, you'll notice even Paul was dealing with all these different philosophers that sat around in Athens to talk about philosophy. And then he brought to them the truth, which was Jesus Christ. Now, one of the problems when you deal with philosophy, and you'll be taught this early on in your class, is that you want to unravel the whole concept of thinking all the way down to what is known as a premise. And so if you can come down to a premise, that's the foundation. Where, from where did all of this thought come from, this premise? And they try to find out what that might be. And generally, those of you who will be Christian, those of you who have a good understanding of God's word, you're going to see where the foundation then would not agree with God's word. And therefore, now you have the crumbling of that philosophical system, not philosophy, but of that system. Now let me quickly say that there are some good Bible college and seminaries, or we might even call it Christian universities, that are understanding the need for people to understand philosophy, that not all philosophy is bad, it's only when it's built upon an inaccurate premise. And so they are now helping young people to realize that they're going to have to compete in a world that's a lot different than some of us had to grow up in or as we started in. And they're preparing them to go head to head against some of the greatest philosophers, some of the greatest minds in other secular universities are thought. But they're able to do that because they're equipping these Christian young people in colleges and universities on what the Bible has to say about good philosophy built upon God's word. Now again, I'm not going to take the next two Sundays to build a whole case on philosophy, but I wanted you to know that not all philosophy is wrong, it's only that philosophy which is not built upon God's word. Now in the context of what we're studying here, I want you to know there are about five different areas what we're going to call, not so much philosophy, but five of what we'll call the world's view, and then five issues of the Christian worldview, and we're going to open that up so we can have some greater understanding of what this is all about. So why don't you follow along with me as we begin the first one here, secular worldview versus a false human teaching. In this context, Paul decided to select three different false teachings in the aspect of who God is and how you get to God. Answering the bigger question, there is a God, 
Can I get to God? Is there an afterlife? How do I get to that afterlife? Now let's look at the first one. The first one is known as legalism. Now we've already taught a lot about legalism, but those of you that haven't been a part of us, let me see if I can reduce it to just a couple of thoughts. First of all, legalism is something that tells you that you must go and do certain kinds of works in order to please God so that He will let you into heaven. That legalism can also creep into Christianity that says that you have to do certain works in order to please God. So it becomes more of a by work spirituality rather than a by grace or faith spirituality. And then for those that are on out the other side of the faith, they'll say that it's by certain amount of works that you have to do. Follow along with me as I read verse 16 to you. It says, so let no one judge you. Now let me pause for a moment. You see that phrase that says, so let no one judge you? In the context that we're studying, three different times Paul is saying, don't let anyone cheat you. Secondly, don't let anyone cheat you. Then he says, don't let anyone judge you. So that tells me that three times in one little small block of verses, it's telling me that you and I have the propensity to be judged as Christians. We have the propensity to be cheated. So he's warning us so close together like screaming, pumping up the volume. Be careful that you're not judged. Be careful that you're not cheated. So as your pastor, in this journey together with God and understanding these things, I have to let you know that we are on the verge of the next piece of information coming our way and us being cheated. So we have to beware or be aware and be alert because we can be so easily cheated. In this context, he's saying, don't let anyone judge you based on food or drink or regarding festival or new moon or Sabbaths. Now, I wish I had the time to stay in the book of Colossians for many, many months or years even because I'd like to pick all of these apart, but I'm going to give it to you all in one little gamut. Whether you have food, in other words, you don't have to say you have to drink this or eat this to go to heaven. You don't have to keep any special festival or new moon to go to heaven. You do not have to keep any form of Sabbath to go to heaven. And he's speaking to those that were Jews who also were starting to slip into Gnosticism. Now, if you will, let's come up for air for just a moment. He's speaking to people that were now Christians, who are former Jews, that were now starting to take some of their Judaism, some of their Christianity, and some of Gnosticism, and scrambling it up, and perhaps now embracing a brand new philosophy, which will do great damage to them, especially if they were going to further teach how to go to heaven, and now have it all mixed up. Now, where does that fit into you and me? All right, that means that there are philosophies out there that because we're so new in the faith, if we hear them mention the Bible, or we hear them mention Jesus Christ, or heaven, or the Holy Spirit, or God, or the virgin birth, we think that because that is somewhere salt and peppered in a belief system, it must be Christianity, or it's probably going to be accurate. And what we have to be very careful for, that even philosophies that might take in, into their philosophy drag some of what Christianity is, we have to be very careful that it is not going to be a mixture of Christianity in something else. So salvation is not faith and something. It is not grace and something. It is not Jesus and something. When the young people led us today in our, the song that talked about in Christ alone, they were making the biblical statement, that everything about God and our relationship to Him comes not by us adding into our world to go do certain things, eat certain foods, drink certain foods, not eat certain foods, not drink certain foods, even celebrate God on a particular day. They wanted us to know biblically that it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So it's not by any form of work. So legalism basically says it's a religion of human achievement. And that's going to say no. The Bible says that's not a part of it. So you run your philosophies down and make sure if once you hear that they're adding anything to Christ, then that philosophy is built upon the world and not upon the word. All right, let's look at the second one. The second one is mysticism. All right, he says, beware also of this. It says, let no one cheat you of your reward. Implying, for those that know Christ as Savior, that there's a reward for you in heaven when you live your Christian life accurately built upon the proper premise. But he says, watch out for mysticism, taking delight in false humility. So in other words, that tells me that not all humility is biblical humility, that there is a true humility and then there's a false humility. One could be contrived, and some of you have heard about people, perhaps even civilizations, where that they feel like to come to God, they have to come to Him on their knees, crawling up 
into some particular sanctuary or some big cathedral somewhere, sometimes over raw concrete, to finally make it bruised, scratched, and bloody, laying prostrate before this great uh, idol of fixture. Now watch. But that idol does not have to be an animal or a bird or a cloud or the sun. It could be none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And we think, well, that must be the right way. But here it's saying, beware of all of this. False humility. True humility is biblical when we realize that in of ourselves we're nothing. But when we're in Christ, we have everything. But it's not about us. It's about him and him alone. Then it says, worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen. Vainly puffed up with a fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head, which would be referring to Christ, from whom all the body nourished and knit together. Now, some of us are probably to the point that we recognize the value of angels. I hope that some of you would take some of our Sunday school classes when they do teach about the angels. There are angels mentioned in the Bible. In fact, even the Lord is known as the angel of the Lord. So, angel is great. Angel worship, angel alatry, like idolatry, is not accurate. And yet in today's society, here's the thinking. I am nothing. I want to get to God. What better way to get to God than to go through some supernatural being? And what better being could that be than his angels? And so we start by uh, making sure that we embrace angels and we get to know the angels. We begin to think like the angels. We take on a supernatural flavor. And what spinoff would we see in some philosophy would be the New Age movement has a great deal to say about angels. And then there is another cult that embraces much of their teaching that has been given to the founder of that cult that came through some angel that is not even a biblical representation of the angel in the Bible. And so now you've got millions of people, one of the fastest growing cults, very that has a lot of its teaching and foundation just on angel and the understanding of angels. So do you say, do they worship angels? No, but they recognize the high prominence of that angel that has so much affected their thinking, their value system, and now their behavior. And the Bible says, be careful, be aware, don't be cheated, and don't be deceived of that angel type of worship. As I was doing this study, I came across this truth that said that even as late as 363 A.D., angels were worshipped, but it was at that time that the biblical sin had got together and they reminded the Christians that the value system is not for Christians to abandon church to follow any form of teaching of the supernatural wrapped up in angels. It wasn't until 739 A.D. that even Michael the archangel was stopped being worshipped. So it was prevalent in the Bible days. It was prevalent centuries after that. It kind of died down, but it seems like it's coming back again. And here it says, be very careful. We do not approach God through angels. In fact, Scripture is so clear on it. And that's why our foundation must be built upon the accuracy of God's Word when it says this very carefully. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Not angels, not works, not me and angels and works. It's only by him. Another verse says, There is only one mediator or go-between between man and God, and that person, that being, is not an angel, not Michael the archangel. It has to be none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, our philosophy is built upon Jesus Christ and Him alone. And watch this. And the accuracy of who Christ is, is described for us in God's Word. That's why we need to be serious students of the Word so that we can sort through some of the mixture that's given to us almost every day that we turn on so-called Christian radio and television. Well, let's move along a little bit faster. Number three. All right, the third here of a false teaching would be asceticism. Now, I know that's a big word, and we probably don't even use it much in our vocabulary or at all. But basically what that says is that you must eliminate things in your life in order for you to become holy or better or more righteous so that you then can connect better to God. So asceticism is the removal of things. So notice the three of them for just a moment. The first one was doing more works to get connected to God. The second one was doing more worship. The problem is it was the wrong object. It was often angels. This one says you have to do without in order to get closer to God. So notice that even swimming in the thinking of the Colossian people at that time were various philosophies that were going on. So Paul, he couldn't just teach one truth. He had to keep going it over and over and over again. 
And I don't know our congregation. I, I don't know how all your thinking is. I don't know what you listen to. I don't know the books that you're reading. I don't know the tapes that you're listening to. But I know that you have to be very careful of the philosophy because the moment they do not have Christ and Christ alone as the foundational truth of that belief system, then all of a sudden you have some stuff that can confuse your value system and eventually even your behavior. So that's asceticism. Let's look at the verse here. It says, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations, such as don't touch this, don't eat, don't handle, which concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments of the doctrines of men, not of God. They sound real good. Men thought it up, though. So now you're following a philosophy of a man who has his own sin and error and propensity to even make mistakes. So he says, don't do these things. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom. Ooh, important. These things, and we could take it all the way up throughout what we've already said. Those things, whether it's legalism, mysticism, or asceticism. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom. In self-imposed religion, it sounds good. I'm following a religion. I have my humility, but it's false. I even neglect my body, but have no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So it's not going to help you to self-deny. As I did my research, I came across a person by the name of Athanasius Anthony. He was a founder of a monastic group. Uh, those are the kind of people that believe that in order to get closer to God, you've got to so much separate from the world that you go into a building where that everybody sacrifices, you eat very little, you hardly ever talk, and you pray and, and think about God, meditate upon Him pretty much all of your life. Some of you know about that. Being alone and being quiet with God occasionally, being free from the distractions and maybe even not talking to others so you can center on God, that's a good thing. But to say that this little monastery is the only way we do it is where there's a great danger. This individual did this, but he felt that his body and his being was so evil that the more he could deny himself, takes a verse out of scripture, denies himself, the more he's going to follow and be like Christ. And it sounds so good, but he doesn't have a correct interpretation of scripture. So what he chose to do, according to the research, was he never changed his vest or washed his feet for his entire life. Now, I could only imagine what he smelled like, and I I don't know what the condition of the health of his feet or even how many friends he had around him. I can tell you this, though, that his life was messed up, but it came from somehow some information came his way, whether he studied it from other philosophers. He chose to think it, value it, and now it changed his behavior. And I'm thinking, what a horrible true loss for humanity that he was, that he would not have had to be if he followed God accurately. And then here's another individual. His name is Simeon, and he followed a group called the Stiletus. And for the last 36 of years of his life, he felt the only way he could get alone was to separate himself from all the accruements of this world. So he climbed up on top of a 30-foot pillar and he lived there the last 36 years of his life thinking that by the more he would sacrifice, the more that he would beat himself up, so to speak, the more humble he would be, the more God eventually would be pleased with him. Now, when you put this teaching against the world, it sounds so good. You know, do whatever it takes to make God happy. You know, if you really love the Lord, you're going to do all this kind of stuff. The problem is God is up there and he's, he's grieving because he says, first of all, that's not what I taught. Secondly, what I am teaching, you're taking out of context and you're adding the rudiments of the world's thinking and you're goofing all of this up. And yet I made you in my image for you to know me and to make me known accurately. And none of them had to go through that if they accurately studied God's word for the purpose of applying it and sharing it with others. So those are just three in the false teaching. But let's look at the biblical worldview of this, and we're going to call this the true teaching of Jesus. I know that's a very simple phrase, but basically the true teaching of Jesus. Again, it says, be aware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Take a moment, if you will, and underline the word, lest anyone. That tells me now that the person who could cheat me, the person who could give me misinformation, whether they would do it ignorantly because they thought it was truth or whether they purposely decided to um, steal my mind away from truth, it does say anyone. That means it could be someone as close as your own mate. I don't mean for you to be so suspect of your mate, but it could be someone in your family. It could be someone that you have trusted who themselves have done so much for you so you feel like, well, they've already done all these other nice things for me. How would, why would they ever want to lie to me about this? It must be true. So that's why it says, lest anyone. And so now you, in a way, we have to be a little suspect. And watch this, even of, of me. You have to be careful of what I might be sharing. So what you're hearing is to stimulate you to go further in the word, get into some more studies, understand this truth. But at the same time, always be aware that someone could give you misinformation. 
that would not be honoring to the Lord. So it says, beware of that. Look at in the bold print there I put for you there. It says, when you have Christ, you have everything. Would you fill that in? When you center down on Christ and Christ alone, essentially what that's saying is you have all that you need. You don't need to do more works to go to heaven. You don't need angels to help you get closer to the Lord. You don't have to cut stuff out of your life because when you have Christ and you embrace him, This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.